complete biographies for each of our speakers is in our uh, forum program. So I'm going to point you there uh, rather than read a long introduction. Today's first speaker has held positions in education from teacher to superintendent. In fact, he mentioned to me at lunch that one of the servers was a student of his and came up and introduced herself. So he is currently the executive director of Battelle for Kids. Would you please join me in welcoming Jim Mahoney to the stage? Our next speaker and guest to our city is the Counselor of Education at the Finnish National Board of Education. Please welcome Leo Packen. And I apologize to him because I probably butchered his name. I'll ask him to say it. He says it with such a gorgeous Finnish accent. On behalf of CMC and our sponsor today, the Puffin Foundation, please once again welcome our speakers. And Jim, the microphone is yours. I think I'll just put this on. I can stand right there. I want to give uh, an introduction to set up the context for this. Years ago, when I was superintendent at Muskingum Valley, which is in Zanesville, if you get off the Seventh Street exit, there's a large parking lot there, and the building has the Educational Service Center, Health Department, and a couple of other agencies. And one morning I got there about 10 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't find a place to park because several trainings were going on. Now, I don't know if you do this or not, I still do it when I can't find a place to park. I just invent a spot. <laughs> now an invented spot is with the last line, those are the really good ones, you just move next to it. So at least half your car is on a line. Well this morning there were so many cars there, I knew there were people waiting for me. I found an invented spot next to an invented spot. I thought fire trucks can get through here, I'll be fine. So I go up into the office, there was a group I had to meet with, never thought about my black car all day long. About six o'clock that evening, it's an October evening, get on the elevator, I come down, as I start to walk out the sliding glass doors, there's a young man from the health department whom I didn't know, who joined me as we walked out, now as we start to walk down the sidewalk, there's my black car. It's two spots out from the nearest parking spot, and all the parking spots are now vacant. I see him looking at my car. I said, why do you suppose somebody would park like that? <laughs> he looked at me and he said, I don't know, drunk or stupid. <laughs> now at that point, I didn't tell him that was my car. I pretended to be waiting for a ride at the end of the sidewalk. <laughs> but the point was this. At 10 o'clock in the morning, it was resourceful. It was creative. And at 6 o'clock in the evening, it was something very different. So the context is important. So I want to set the context up for you. Battelle for Kids has been around for a dozen years. We've worked in the school improvement arena in approximately 20 states, particularly Ohio and Tennessee, and we do lots of things relative to that. But one of our projects this last year that we wanted to do was to find where are the highest performing systems in the world? Because the truth of it is our competition is no longer across the county. It's no longer across the state or across the country. It is very much across the world. And we wanted to visit those places and learn from those folks who have been getting extraordinary results over time with kids. So there are a number of international tests that are given by OECD. And we looked at those. We had a couple of researchers who went through that, came back and said, here's whom we believe are in the top 10 that if you chose many of these, they are sustained improvers. In other words, it's not a country that had great results for its kids one year, had gone from here to here. But these are countries or systems that have had sustained high achievement for all kids, but also continued to grow that achievement. So they are, they're, in fact, they're referred to as sustained achievers. It's over a decade. Now, we chose them for the obvious reasons. And at the heart of what we did was to ask this question. What is it that they do with their kids that seems to account for this extraordinary success? What lessons can we learn? So we benchmarked against those that are very, very good. As an aside, I did that when I was coaching because I learned that anybody could be 0 and 18. It doesn't take a lot of work to do that. <laughs> so I found somebody to <clears throat> learn from. But you get the idea. The thing I like about visiting and encouraging that sort of thing is that if, if you and I trade a dollar, we still have a dollar. 
but if you and I trade an idea, we now each have two ideas. So it was to generate ideas and to give us a different way of looking at this. Now, the five areas that we chose included Finland, which is frankly the highest of the high, and they have been for over a decade. In addition, Hong Kong, Singapore from Asia, Ontario, Canada, our neighbors to the north, and one large city that participates in America that's part of is Long Beach, California. So those five areas, we sent teams. Now the teams included people from Battelle for Kids, but we also invited union representatives for the state's unions, uh, the school boards association, uh, the business community. There were several business members in the Columbus Partnership uh, who were part of that. So we reached out to a variety of folks to say, come with us. You see education from a different perspective. Uh, we thought about, and it's really important uh, about the questions. And I need to say this, uh, Isidore Rabin was a winner, a Nobel Prize winner from Columbia University in physics. And he said in his memoirs, he said, I'll tell you what I remember, what contributed more to what I've done in my life than anything, he said, was my mother. He said, most kids would come home, their mother would say, well, what did you learn today? He said, my mother never asked me that. My mother would say, what good question did you ask today? And delighted in telling her the good question that I'd come up with. And he said, that contributed more to me becoming a scientist than anything. It is about good questions. So we thought about the questions that we would ask. And then to see something. Because if a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, a visit is worth even more. So you can ask teachers what it is. So for example, Greg, I asked many teachers, I said, do you teach this? Do you ever say to kids, you need to know this because it's on the test? And I visited Finland. They looked at me like, what? We would never do that. I can assure you there's any American classroom that would be asked. And I don't mean that in any critical way. It's just a descriptive fact. So we did the visits. We came back. We made a commitment because there were lots of people that we couldn't take, particularly practitioners. So this past Monday, we had a global summit, and we had teams from those five areas describe what they do in an all-day plenary sessions, ask lots of questions. Then the next day, our international visitors stayed with us, and we started what we hope will be a tremendous international learning community, a collaborative of sorts, so that we have groups that we can regularly communicate with, share with, ideas, all of those things. So that's part of the role that Battelle for Kids has played in this. Now, as you can imagine, there's huge variation across countries and within countries. So the things that we write about and suggest were high-level themes. If you saw the uh, mural outside before you came in, we had a couple of artists who listened to the presentations on Monday from each of our teams. They made that mural. So it was a it's a great learning activity to watch. And then, of course, we made copies and we'll make that available to folks who were at the summit. But it was very, very powerful. The other person who's here today who was responsible for coordinating, doing the work, we wrote, and I believe there are a few of these on your table, it's a monograph about the global education study. What did we learn? And we talked much more about the specificities that we found within those countries. If there's not one on your table or you don't have one, they will be available on our website at Battelle for Kids in a couple of weeks. And you're more than welcome to download or to read it online because we did learn some lessons. So the last thing I want to do is I want to quickly share six drivers of success that we saw demonstrated largely across all of these areas. And then I'm going to ask Leo some questions about Finland in particular and to give you opportunities to ask questions that may be on your mind. But I'm going to set the context up a little bit about Finland because I got the chance to visit Finland. And I have to tell you, Leo, one of the people that we met on the first day said to me, he said, you have a slogan in America. I think it's leave no child behind. He said, here we believe it. And it was very powerful. <laughs> It was very, very powerful because at the end of the day, I had a philosophy professor at Ohio State tell me, he said, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you do. I'll tell you what you believe. 
we saw practices. And frankly, the six drivers of student success, these are not things that if you looked at America and you went, gosh, we never thought of that. It's not true. Like most things, the difference is not in knowing. The difference, of course, is in doing. But the six drivers included these very quickly. Early intervention. Leo will talk about, and I'll ask him one question. They don't start, students don't start the school first grade until they're seven years old. But they do lots of things prior to getting there. And then those early grades, what they do. It's that old investment that a good beginning often determines the ending. So we saw lots of preschool and the investments that were made to get kids ready for school so that they could succeed. So that was the first driver that we saw over and over again was the early intervention. Another driver was teacher selectivity. You'll see in Finland about 10% of the candidates who apply to become teachers actually are admitted to the program to become teachers. They put lots of emphasis on the front end as to who becomes that as opposed to sometimes in some places we make it much easier to become a teacher and then try to figure out uh, who's more or less suited for this. So that becomes a part. There was a focus on learning, not assessments. Uh, developing a love of learning is very, very powerful. And it's not, assessments are used to give people feedback. Here's how you did, here's how you could do it better, here's how you would, could improve, as opposed to just looking at test results. And that's why when I would ask teachers, do you ever say to kids, I, uh, you need to know this because this will be on the test, and they were appalled because they never thought about these international tests. Uh, in fact, there's not even a Finnish word for accountability. So when you begin to think of different roads to getting somewhere, but teacher selectivity, early intervention, a focus on learning, not assessments. This one was very powerful. The link between education and economic development. What we know in this country, the biggest economic tool we can have is a good education. So what is it they do to inextricably link these so that students who are college and career ready, as we would say, absolutely have avenues to go to. And that brings me to another, which is finding individual pathways for student success. Uh, kids come with different skills. They have different gifts. They have different interests. They have different abilities. And it's matching those up with a pathway that enables them to be successful. That was yet another very, very powerful one. And the sixth one, the last one, was culture the cultural expectation you have. I will tell you, remember many years ago uh, when NCLB was passed, it's been a decade now, people would say to me, do you really think that 100% of our kids will be proficient in 2014? Because this was the decade long, actually it was 12 years out. I said, no, I don't. But I don't want to put a sign up in front of my school that might say, well, welcome to Central Elementary School. Some of the kids here will learn. Maybe yours will be one of them. Poor performance is not a sin, but low aim is. So you ask yourself, what is the cultural expectation for our children? Not our schools, our children. Because educating everyone takes everyone. So it was very, very difficult to talk about what any of these places did and not also talk about the culture. So there's a little bit of the context, and I want to stop now because I want to, Leo and I are going to have a conversation, then I want to give you chances to enter the conversation, and part of the questions I'm going to ask him will give you some insights into some things we learned about Finland. Okay, you, you ready, Leo? Yes, yes. Leo, has real, we've had a great time. Leo got to see an Ohio State football game yeah. Saturday. We went to Thank a game. You. He got to experience the whole political process, uh, as we did all, including last night. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this. I visited a middle school in Finland, and I talked to a principal there. Very high-performing school in the highest-performing country in the world. And I looked at this principal, and I said, now, let me get this straight. You don't evaluate teachers. You don't go in classrooms and evaluate teachers. He said, nope. I said, you don't spend much time with discipline. He said, nope. And I said, there's no Finnish word for accountability. He said, that's right. I said, well, first of all, on behalf of all the middle school principals in America, including me at one time, 
we would all want to know, what is it you really do then? <laughs> uh, but having put that aside, those are real things. The, la the accountability, the lack of teacher evaluation, some of the very things that are levers for us. Uh, what does help to explain the success of finished schools? Because we know what I just mentioned is true. Yeah, this is the first good question. <laughs> <laughs> I try to make a good answers as well, but well, uh, there's many, many things which makes system works well. And, uh, and uh, about this accountability, I like to uh, share our idea of that. Um, well, we trust teachers very strongly uh, because they have a very good qualification from the university. All the teachers have to have at least master degree level, five years, six years studies in the university. And class teachers' main subject is education. So how to grow child so that she or he will find his best ways of, of performing. So that's, it's very important that they are very highly qualified to be process, professionals in schools. So we can trust them. Only what we need to do is give them the target, what we want to be as a product from the school. And uh, well, I can say it very simple. Uh, our aim is happy life, that everybody will participate in our society and being, and being very happy on, on there, doing whatever they do there. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we saw, and, and I may not have this right, so correct me, is uh, about half of your kids go to uh, what's called a vocational school, half go to an upper comprehensive high school. And these vocational schools, the programs that were offered were a direct function of having met with the ministry to be tied into jobs of the future. And you almost got the sense that it was an equal respect for any student destination. Is that accurate? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, uh, in the beginning, we have a so-called comprehensive school, that lasts nine years. It's very common for everybody to learn and study. But we like to give good basement for future studies and time to make a decision of life. What are you going to be? Are you going to be academic or vocational forces? So in a uh, vocational uh, part, you will find several ways of being professional. But the uh, main idea is that, that uh, uh, when we are planning the uh, curriculum for there, we are working together with the, with the business life or industry or any sector what we, we like to share our, our, our uh, system. And uh, they, this is very important to see how different sectors are uh, developing and what we need to do in our education. So conversation is Continuous. We do all the time this. So it's, it's very helpful. And the second thing in, on this system is that, that uh, well, if you find out that this is not my, my area, I can't work in this, I need something else, you can change, you can jump to the other and continue studies. And those studies, what you already done, can include it to your, your further studies. And then if you made a real, real bad decision to take, for example, upper secondary general, school and going maybe aiming to the university, but you fail, you don't feel good there, you can change to the vocational school directly. Or one more time, it's possible to study in both the same time and got the two qualification after three or four years. So it's actually, it's very flexible to find your pathways to the working forces or higher education if you like to. Okay. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about the early intervention. While kids don't start till seven, what is it that you do prior to that as a society, and then what it is you do when kids uh, start school, particularly those with special needs? Okay, uh, first, um, uh, we have a very strong kindergarten system or daycare system maybe, because uh, plenty of kids stay at home or uh, family daycare places where it's not many children taken care. Uh, and uh, after, after five years, when they add five, we have a system that we check talking and 
how your kinetic things and th like that is is working on and uh, and uh, then if there is some kind of problem we will help at at moment we are not waiting that the children will uh, grow up to uh, over the problems we like to help for, for example i can give a very simple <laughs> uh, example uh, finnish language has uh, 23 different phonetics and they are quite uh, easy only one is very difficult it's it's r you know our letter, but we pronounce it R. And it's quite a difficult for kids to learn. And even that time, we like to help and give some expert or specialist to help what to do with the kid that she or he will learn to pronounce in this correct. So we even take very small things and try to help. That's the one. And we, we are not talking about learning, reading and writing things yet. Because it somehow happens that the, our kids, they learn reading quite easily because of the language. That's the one fact. And that is maybe the, the most biggest, or how do you say, the biggest thing on your life when you start reading. Because it's the way how you can take a knowledge, information around you without any help, without help or your parents' help. And it's huge leap, huge step that time. And uh, <coughs> now we come to the, the special education. If this doesn't happen, you know, you will be all the time behind your peer group, your friends. So it's very important in the beginning of school years or even before school to find if there is some problem in reading or writing. And I also include mathematics. Because math is a little bit different than reading and writing. But still, if you have a problems there and you try to learn something on math, maybe you learn some parts from there and there, but the complete or construction of mathematics will, will miss some parts. And later, you will have a huge problems even to learn math. So that's why in math, we are also putting quite a much emphasis if there is some problems. So early how do you say, early intervention or early prevention. It means that we'd like to do all what we can do in the beginning. Because later on, maybe we don't need to do anything yet. Because everything is fine after that. And the student can be among the day, day friends and, and the, among the day classes and enter and, 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 and uh, develop their skills the similar way as the other ones are doing. And maybe I can tell you that there is a University of Jyväskylä, uh, Erkki Lyyti, uh, is, a, is a very, very uh, famous uh, uh, professor. And uh, his area is uh, reading and writing. And he made a, a research among those students who father or mother has some uh, problems in reading and writing. They were diagnostic and find it. And there was a, some kind of prediction that those kids under five years old maybe will have, a, or they will, might have the similar problems uh, in, in the school. So they put extra help. Actually, maybe there was five different kind of experts to help those kids in the beginning of the school, and they even count how much money was needed. It was something like 3,000 euros per one one kid. It's quite much money, but they like to do everything. And you know, later on, they followed those kids, what happened to the school years, and you know, they didn't need any kind of special support later. And then he made a calculation. What does it mean? We know exactly that in Finland we have 5.4 million people, age group is something like 60,000, and in this, among this, uh, you can actually know how many of those will have some problems in reading and writing. And if we help them put this money, it's just a simple calculation, how much money is needed, and later on, how much money will be saved. This input will come back in the 10 years 100 times. So it's, it's obvious to do that even in an economic way, that we save money by doing that way, how we are nowadays doing. 
So it's research-based. We, we know exact facts why we should do that. That's a commentary, a prime example of the difference between knowing and doing. Uh, I, I want to ask you this question, because here's one that I observed. I don't know whether it's accurate or not, but in this country, we have huge discrepancies between performance, there are achievement gaps, there are huge discrepancies among spending. Uh, our highest, most affluent suburban schools spend at a level which is dramatically different than particularly our very poor rural schools. So we have big discrepancies, yet I got the sense uh, in the Finnish schools there was uh, a, a huge degree of equity. Is that accurate? And can you talk a little bit about what that means there? Yeah, um, we try to keep our school quite a similar. And uh, there's one way is that, that we are supporting those who need more support. Like um, uh, northern part of Finland, there is not so many people living, not so many taxpayers, and uh, our ed education is almost totally public funded. And half of the total cost is uh, uh, covered by municipalities' money, taxpayers' money, and the rest comes from the government, also taxpayers' money. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but you know, we like to share different way this money. I call it somehow a Robin Hood system, taking from the rich municipality and giving to the poor ones. That is not exactly this way, but, but it looks like that. So those who need more, they will have more, because they, they are struggling otherwise. They can't offer similar high quality education there in the north than in the south. But if we give extra support for them, they can do that as well. And then one more thing is that, that because there is not so many people living, but still our philosophy is offer local school so that you don't need to travel so long distances from your home to the school. That means that the, our schools are quite small there and they are more expensive than the big units. We know that, but, but still we know we make a, some kind of calculation and use this as a factor. What is the density of the population in that area? They will have a different amount of money for support of their school. So that keeps our school similar, or maybe we can say that the, our municipalities, because they are in a different situation, they can offer same kind of school and, and facilities for everybody in their area. That, that's the one thing what we like to do. And the, the second thing what we need also is that, that we don't uh, evaluate or, or assist our school or rank our school anyway. We have an evaluation system, but it's very light version. We took maybe seven to 10% of age group we took different part of, uh, of country school, big school, small schools, and very specific system how we took not all the students, maybe every second, maybe every third, depending on the size of the school. So we cut the sample, and this sample tells enough well what is the, what is the situation in Finland. And that what we do, we don't do every year. We do every second year math, every second year maybe literature, maybe every fifth year in, in physical education, etc., etc. We have a special program how to do it. And we guarantee also that every school will include this sample at least once in the five years. So all the school will have a feedback, in this case, uh, about that where they are comparing the whole country average. But because this is sample, not all school included, the ranking is nonsense. It's, 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 not, it's not helping. Even our media try to do that, of course. They try to find the, what is the best school in Finland. But it's, it's, it's not working that way. So if we are not ranking, we are not labeling our school, it means that the teachers also keep there where they are. Otherwise, if we can say that this is the best school I think the best teacher will go there, and those who are not so good school will have a rest. Not so good teachers, maybe. So we can keep, well, it's an artificial way to do it, but we try to keep our school very similar in this way also by not ranking them. 
and our evaluation is for development. So the school who, who are uh, participating in our evaluation can use the result for their own development work. They can find their own where, uh, own uh, challenges and also those where they are very strong and doing well. All the school have to do actually self-evaluation every year and we try to help them to how to do it. We have uh, some kind of um, criteria for uh, uh, quality uh, in basic education but it's just uh, some kind of recommendation to use that. They can use own tools if they like. Uh, <coughs> you get a real sense of what it's uh, of what it's like from, from uh, some of Leo's answers. What I think now, Jane, well, may be good to, let's open it up to some questions that you may have, because I know there are many here who particularly work in education who may have some questions. Wonderful, well, we've certainly had some <coughs> good uh, food for thought, and I know we have many questions. Um, as uh, those of you who come frequently know, CMC always leaves time for questions, and you already have the drill down pat. Go to the microphone, introduce yourself, uh, ask your question, and uh, try not to make uh, an editorial comment, or I will ask you what your question is. So please, go ahead. I will make sure that these are questions. <clears throat> Greg Brown uh, with the Graham Family of Schools. We have four charter, public charter schools here in Columbus. Uh, Jim, Leo, thank you for being here. Jim, thank you ongoing for your work to help support uh, schools and education. Leo, thank you for sharing with us here. My question has to do with the relationship between what you said, Leo, as the ultimate goal of Finnish schools, which is creating happy uh, Finns, um, and assuming that we can define what happiness and meaning is, um, I'd like to know uh, from you, Jim, if you've seen any s relationship between happiness as a end goal and high success uh, by all the other world standards that Finland has. And Leo, what those elements are uh, that you see in Finnish schools that cause um, the subject areas or the the academic focus that cause happiness to actually occur. You talk about what happy is in <laughs> Finland and the things that contribute to it. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the direction where the Finnish education is, is heading is, is more about that how you learn things, not, not only academic things. So our core curriculum is such somehow describing these, these targets, telling that, okay, these are what we like to have. The content is not so important. Of course, we are having a list of things in math, for example, this and this and this, but they are, they are just the tools to get those targets. So learning is in a focus. And if we compare to this, what is the global trends? I know there is a numeracy, literacy. They are looking these, standardization. And, and we don't do that. How, how do they, I'm going to follow up on Greg's. <clears throat> how would you define happy in Finland? Well, <laughs> let, let's put this very simple because um, <clears throat> I have a fr good friend, uh, Professor Nevalina from Aalto University. Helsinki and uh, he traveled a lot and uh, visit lots of important persons and they always ask what is your uh, secret of success? Why, why you are you doing so well? And, and he used to say that it's hot meal. <laughs> and uh, why? Uh, maybe it's that that the children when they come to school they feel like a home. They took shoes off they see carpets there, maybe flowers. It's, it's, they feel safe. That's, that's something what, what we have to have as a starting point. It's a good, good way of start learning. And two activities in school. When you feel that you are like a home. And when you are home, I think quite many of us are very happy there. So it's, it's sometimes it's just a very small thing what you need to do and, and it works. You know, I, I, I want to just <clears throat> quickly add, some of you may have read David Brooks' uh, column this morning in the Dispatch, 
where he talks, and he's written a book about character achievement, and he, he writes a lot about this. He's a conservative columnist of the New York Times, but he talked about happy family life and how much that contributes to success. But there's also a book he has talked about that uh, I just recently uh, got called Why Children Succeed. And the authors in this study make a real point about how important non-cognitive factors are to adult success. Grit, self-control, resilience, all of which the authors believe <clears throat> can be taught. That that in itself, it's not just academic success that contributes to uh, someone's success. And uh, I don't know whether the middle school student who's a grown lady here now remember it, but I remember saying to kids many, many times, your I do is every bit as important as your IQ. Uh, and there are things that we can do to develop I do as well. So I think those, those do contribute uh, very much to uh, <clears throat> adult and student success. Let's go to our next question, please. Hi, I'm Wendy Bortz, and I have a question about um, teaching mathematics. I was interested in hearing you say that you teach that uh, as an, you know, before the kids actually start. And I wonder, um, it seems like, in, in the experiences I have, that a lot of kids maybe fall behind in math here, and then they never quite catch up. And I wondered if you have a system for teaching math that enables children to progress at their own rate and um, what kind of math you require, you know, to what level do you require the children to learn math? Okay, thank you for this question because my background is mathematics. So, <laughs> so uh, well, uh, first thing is that, that uh, we need to give very good experiences or experience of math. Not, not talking about the mathematical terms, words. You can do mathematics. You can uh, classify things, you can order them, you can color things, you can share, divide, whatever. Children like to do that. And they don't know that they are doing math. So that's the first thing, experience, collecting lots of experience. And then the second thing is that, uh, of course we know that some of our children are very, very fast learners. They are runners. And then there are those who are not so good. Then we give them Roller, roller skates, or blades, how do you say them? I don't know yeah, exactly. That's good. But, but yeah. it means that we help them to be in, in the same group. So inclusion means that you are helping those who, are need, who need this help. So in uh, 2010, we started a new way of special education. And the special education, first step there is a, a, just a ordinary or support for anybody. For all students, if they need. You just ask teacher that I need something, or teacher indicate that there is something problem and, and help. Maybe it lasts one week, two weeks, one month. That's okay. But if it's not working, the next step is intensive special education. Then we start looking the individual Plan, uh, uh, the program of learning in special subjects, not all subjects, but some subjects, for example in math. We try to find the key, key uh, uh, concepts there and, and what, what you need to learn, what is the core of this whole thing, and help that way. And normally that time also special education teacher will help, not only the class teacher or subject teacher. And finally, if this is not working, we make a decision about the special education, and then there will be real special education teacher or educator doing almost the whole, whole, whole uh, uh, instruction. But we try to keep this as long as long we can, not making this label that you are special education, boy or girl. Because later you can't get rid of it. It's like a tattoo, and you can even explain somewhere when you are lazy and don't want to do something, you just say, oh, I can't learn that because I'm a special education boy. So that's how we like to keep this as much as we can, as a s behind and available for everybody, but not marking them as a special education boy and girl. Thank you. Hello, I'm 
Cindy Byington, and my questions center around licensing and pay scale for your teachers. You mentioned that the teachers, uh, you invest in the teachers up front, they're very highly qualified, um, especially when you're talking about the early years, and that is not always the case here. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, does the state require certain licensing? Um, are all teachers paid equally, or how does that work here? We, the system here is, is different, and I would like to hear what they do in Finland. Yeah. I see that you, you are pointing correct places, exact places, what is very important. First, uh, teacher salaries is all, all over the country similar. But uh, depending which subject teacher you are, well, how many hours you have to work per week, there are some differences. Literature teachers are doing less than math teacher, for example. So it's 16 hours per week for literature teacher, it's a minimum. And then math teacher is doing 18 or uh, 19 hours per week. So that's the only what, what makes difference. So salaries are same for men and women, so that's, that's clear. And, uh, and then uh, one very interesting thing is that what what also already Jim mentioned, that, that the uh, teacher profession is very popular. You know, it's among the five, top five in Finland. Lawyer, doctor of medicine, teacher, policeman, and fireman. That's five. So it's there. So, and why it's there? Because we value, it's a, it's a, it's a very high status of, of being a teacher in Finland. You can, you can be, be proud to tell that I'm teacher. And everybody says, wow, that's nice. <laughs> and uh, then why it's also uh, generating new, new teachers, it's because teachers are so good. They are doing well, and the children are looking there in the classroom and say, wow, oh, I want to be a teacher as well. <laughs> My daughter was a, a first grader and came home and thought, father, I want to be a teacher. What I should do? <laughs> she was only seven years old and know already that she will be a teacher. So that's, if you see somebody doing well, you maybe take as a model that I want to be a teacher as well. And then the licenses, uh, we don't have it as, no. It's, it's a, it's a universal, universal master degree, what you got after graduation. You got two professions at the same time. One is teaching, and the second one is the uh, is the researcher. So all the teachers are also researchers if they like to do that. They can stay there in university. They can st start working. They can uh, research their own work, or they can take a leave and, and make make for example doctoral thesis if they like to. So it's helping helping them. But we are not giving any license that I'm a teacher. Look, I'm a teacher. Uh, only what we need is then when you are applying new post, you are sending your papers, and in your paper they have to say that you have studied educational studies, at least this and this amount, then you have to show, uh, show that you have done your practicing in some uh, 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 training schools, and then there have to be marks on those subjects what you're going to be teach. That's all. It's your certificate, but not the license, like a teacher license. That's not existing. Let's get through these uh, next two questions, and then we'll be able to adjourn on time. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Brad Onken from Zayner Bloser. We're an educational curriculum provider. Um, in this, I heard you mention literacy and writing several times, and actually together. Uh, there's a debate going on in this country now uh, about writing and, and whether or not children need to actually learn to physically handwrite or learn to keyboard. I'm curious mm -hmm. to know in Finland, do you teach uh, children handwriting or is everything done electronically through technology? Uh, we are teaching them handwriting, but we have a similar discussion going on in Finland that in the future maybe it's so, not so important anymore, but still our research is saying that uh, on your learning process, like me, I'm having, this is learning process for me, I have a pencil in my hand, because doing by hands, helping your thinking, it's, 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 it's a, some kind of uh, extra memory to your, yourself. 
you're writing down things you are doing it twi twice. Once you're thinking here, but also you're writing it down. So it's, it's, it's not so easy just get rid of and throw the pencil away and start keyboards. Keyboards is needed, of course, but I, I think that we, we are going to keep this still on work. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you both for coming. My name is Warren Fishman. This is really interesting. And um, I, 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 it was very interesting what you've said, Leo. And um, I, I, I realize you're, uh, Finland is number one in education or whatever, uh, high in education. But uh, I think it's difficult to compare the United States to Finland as much as I know about Finland. And I'd like you to explain that. Um, we have to deal with diversity. We're a melting pot in the United States. And frankly, right here in Columbus, Ohio, we have kids that come to our schools, our public schools, that have spent the first 10 years of their life in refugee camps, mm -hmm. and they can't read and write in their own language, let alone our, our native language, English. So um, uh, I, I don't know how diverse Finland is, but uh, do you have to deal with that? And, and um, uh, can you tell us a little about that? Yes. Um. Well, uh, I think the Finnish people, we are quite a homogeneous, very similar. And uh, uh, w if we go back 100 years, it was almost 100% of uh, reading and writing skills already that time. So we don't have a just problem that there will be persons who are not able to read at all. Well, it's, it's a, another story maybe. <laughs> I will tell why, why we had such a good good uh, uh, history on that. But uh, what I have seen here in a couple of days, uh, I have noticed that you have all of these things already here, what we have in Finland. Just I think that the, there have to be somehow parallel thinking and put those blocks on the right direction. It's, it's, it's so simple. Finland is not so much different. In, I, I, I have seen that. So, and, uh, and I think the distances are shorter and shorter every year because of the internet and, and, and connections and, and so on. So, well, I, I, I can explain this better than this, but uh, you, have, you have a lot of things here. And actually, if we research deeper, we can find that many, many good things for education has started from here. And they have go over the <coughs> sea and, and find Europe and, and Finland finally. We have our own, maybe own uh, implementation, how we did it. But the idea is somewhere else. Well, thank you both. I think if there were um, dozens of ideas shared, now we all have those ideas and there's 100 plus of us out here, so lots and lots of ideas to implement. Um, if you enjoyed this forum today, which I hope you did, uh, please feel free to share the Columbus Metropolitan Club forums online. You can go to our website, look at this forum again, um, forward it to a friend or refer someone else to it so that those ideas multiply even farther. We appreciate that. Be sure to make your uh, reservation for next week where we host Honda, 30 years of Ohio and job impact. I'd like you uh, to invite you to continue our conversation in the lobby with some uh, coffee and cookies and uh, enjoy these speakers once more. Thank you to our sponsor today, the Puffin Foundation West Limited. And thank you genuinely to Jim Mahoney from Battelle for Kids and Leo uh, Pakin from Finland. A safe trip home and bless you for being here. Uh, thank you all.